After a year of poor execution and weak stock and weak stock price, Six Flags execs find themselves under siege by activist investor Jonathan Litt. Joining us now for more on this battle is City Leisure and Entertainment analyst James Hardiman. James, good to uh, see you here this morning. How do you think this one ultimately shakes out? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the, the the activist report that was put out the other day, it's it's certainly a, a good conversation starter, right? Um, it gets people talking about what is what is ultimately a dislocation in the stock. Uh, but I think it's important to remember why we're here. We're here because um, this new strategy um, that was imparted by the, 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 the CEO that came in roughly a year ago um, has thus far been extremely slow to, to bear fruit. Uh, as a matter of fact, the stock has moved in the, in the wrong direction for the better part of the last year, um, which in this space, in this industry, with these these assets that that generate a lot of cash, um, whenever you have that sort of a, 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 an underperformance, a, a, a dismal performance, you're going to get some level of activism, some level of sort of uh, non-traditional uh, alternatives to, to, to just running the business. So in this case, the non-traditional alternative that's being proposed by Land and Buildings is to sell the real estate or spin it off and put it in a real estate investment trust and then lease it back. Does that make sense to you, a move like that? Uh, it makes sense. It's, it's certainly not a new idea, right? right. This, is, this is an idea that the company evaluated pretty seriously uh, back in 2016 and 2017 and ultimately decided against. Um, there are a lot of um, aspects to this, right? I, I do think some of the valuation uh, metrics that, that were used by the, the, the activists were, were maybe a little bit optimistic. Um, there are very much tax consequences of any move like this. But I think the longer the stock sits here in the low 20s, and at one point it was in the, in the high teens, the more that you can make an argument for this sort of financial engineering, right? This valuation arbitrage at the end of the day. Um, does this happen in the format that's been proposed? My guess is not, um, but there are a lot of steps in between, right? They don't have to take their entire real estate portfolio uh, and sell it uh, in one piece. Um, the idea that they could take a property or two or three uh, and use that as a source of capital and, and ultimately lease that back, um, that seems like a more likely course of, uh, uh, course of action here. And of course, I should mention, uh, we reached out to uh, head of comms or head of communications over at Six Flags, Stephen Pertel. Uh, he just hasn't felt like getting back to us. I do want to ask you this, James. Uh, what gets people back in these parks? What is the fundamental problem with Six Flags? Does the food stink? Are the rides boring? How do they regain or, or jumpstart their business? Sure. So there's two components. There's the industry, right? And we did see some slowing uh, really over the course of the summer across the industry. And I think that's just sort of macro pressure. I do think think the theme parks generally hold in better than, than most sort of discretionary uh, forms of entertainment. But then there is the company specific aspect of this, right? Six Flags put in this strategy, you know, we called it the Jerry Maguire strategy. Fewer customers, uh, better service. Um, a lot of people, you know, basically said that they fired their customer this year. Um, and so the, the idiosyncratic part of the story is, has kind of been a mess as of late. I think there's still ch a chance that this strategy may work, but they're going to have to figure out how to win back at least a portion of those customers that they didn't want to lose. And James, while we have you here, um, as we are in this holiday season and there's been so much talk about people moving around, traveling, you cover yeah. um, the cruise line operators as well. And at this time where people want to still be getting out there, how are you viewing the cruise industry and, and sort of where it is in that period of recovery? A lot of risk uh, <laughs> still, uh, but also a, a lot of opportunity. Look, I, you know, so much of consumer discretionary right now is figuring out the recession impact uh, on these various categories. Um, the good news, if you want to call it that, is, is a recession, if it's just a recession, would be an improvement for the cruise industry relative to where they've been the last couple of years. We're finally starting to see uh, some better pricing, right? We've seen pricing up in, in just about every category. Carnival just announced the other day that their pricing is now up versus 2019. I think there's an opportunity here, and I, and I do think this has historically been a remarkably resilient industry. Uh, that said, there's a ton of risk. Right. There is 
uh, weather risk. There is COVID and, and, and other sort of viral or disease related risk. There's the war is a, is a big deal, right? The war in Ukraine uh, certainly is, is problematic as you think about people moving around to, to different parts of, of the world. Obviously, fuel costs, right? That is their biggest single expense line. So there are a lot of moving parts to the story. Um, if, if we could fast forward to two years from now, three years from now, I think the, the whole cruise industry is going to be in a much better place. Um, but it might be a, a, a we might be taking the scenic route, just given uh, how many how many uh, external factors can move these stocks. Excellent wordplay. Thanks so much, James. And happy holidays to you. Happy Thanks holidays. for spending some time with us today and this year as well. City Leisure and Entertainment Analyst James Hardiman, thank you.